There are very great powers that be. Uh, first of all, the commercial powers that be. I mean, both Moderna and Pfizer have just in the last week uh, reported record profits. Uh, these are vast companies that have had absolute boomer years for the past few couple of years for obvious reasons. They don't want to hear, no doubt, your, your hesitations and your concerns. And it feels like there's also political forces that because the vaccines have become this kind of culture war issue, particularly in America, any scientist such as yourself that raises any hesitation about anything to do with vaccines is liable to be kind of either silenced or attacked in some way. Do you feel that? Do you feel nervous about putting this study out there? I certainly do, but I've been in this game for for now almost 30 years, uh, studying vaccines and finding these non-specific effects, which have been very controversial. Uh, and, and really, like you say, there, there are large, uh, strong powers out there who don't really want to hear about them because basically, to me, they're good news. It means that we could optimize the use of vaccines to not only be these strong protective effects against vaccine diseases as we know them, but we can also optimize their use in terms of overall health. And we can do that by just intelligently designing vaccine programs which takes non-specific effects into account by making sure that children have live vaccines uh, um, to a large extent and, and also making sure that the live vaccines are the most recent vaccine because non-specific effects Differently from the specific effects, they are most prominent as long as a vaccine is the most recent vaccine. So you can actually give the non-live vaccines to a girl and then shortly after give a live vaccine and, and, and then completely benefit both from the specific protective effect against the vaccine disease, but also abrogate or, or mitigate any potential negative non-specific effects. So, so there are really ways where yeah, a professor from Australia recently calculated that if we just use what we know about these effects right now to design vaccination programs which take into account non-specific effects, we could probably save a, a, an average of one million child lives every year. So, so these are strong effects. They could make us, if we took them into account, we could have much more intelligent vaccination programs. Uh, so, so, so there are low-hanging fruits out there by acknowledging non-specific effects uh, and, and taking them into account. But it is also a bit of a Pandora's box, I think, for health authorities, because if they start acknowledging these effects, they are also the, the huge problem of potential negative non-specific effects that have actually been brought to the attention of the WHO already 20 years ago, but, but they haven't really responded to the observations. So you can see the potential backlash for WHO, for vaccination programs, if, if it actually comes out that some vaccines have carried these negative non-specific effects. So I've been in this uh, business for many years and I know that there are powers out there who aren't interested in really digging into these findings. Uh, and, and, and again, it also has implications for the way we test vaccines. So you can also see the it is complicated stuff also for companies or regulators if we need to design vaccine um, trials, phase three trials, which do not only study the specific disease, but also study all cause uh, mortality and morbidity. But in my point of view, uh, this is this should be good news, but, but it's handled as if it's bad news. Uh, likewise, with the COVID vaccines, it should be good news that we, I mean, we can use the vaccines more intelligently if we know there are non-specific effects. But, but there is not a lot of interest. Uh, there, uh, there is a major pushback, to be honest. I understand what you mean, Professor, but to the billion or so people who have taken Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, it's not going to sound like good news that the first big study into all-cause mortality is inconclusive as to whether it has a positive or negative effect. I, I really want to, to, to just uh, carefully uh, frame how we are talking about it because, of course, these studies were undertaken at a time where, where there was also protective measures in place against COVID. There weren't that many COVID cases. Uh, so, so, you know, the, this ratio of potential benefits versus potential harms in various categories of disease look differently. You know, have there been 
a blooming COVID uh, Delta pandemic where there had been massive exposure to Delta, then the the relative effect of the vaccine against COVID death would have counted more on the overall mortality than, than the contribution from potential cardiovascular diseases so, or, or death. So I, there's no way I can say this would be the net effect in any context of the vaccines. It also depends very much on age group we know. So I mean, I would clearly recommend somebody who is 75 to take an mRNA vaccine and, and live with that uh, potential unknowns in terms of, of uh, side effects on other diseases. But again, the, that picture would look completely different if you're 30 and you're completely healthy. Uh, then obviously your risk of dying of COVID would be so low that you wouldn't, it wouldn't be acceptable with any increased risk of dying from any, any other disease. Which is, which does, should we conclude then that your recommendation, were you the policy chief, would be to only vaccinate older people with these mRNA vaccines? W at what age would you say it's no longer risk reward worth it to take a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine? <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, if I were to decide and I had to decide right here and now based on what we know and based on the current situation, I wouldn't recommend vaccination of anybody above 50 years of age. Is that just with the Pfizer Moderna or is that any COVID vaccines? That would be just for the Pfizer Moderna vaccine as it is currently. I'm, I'm getting curious about what looks like potential beneficial non-specific effects of the adenovirus uh, uh, vector vaccines. I mean, this is the interesting part of your, another interesting part of your study, which is that the vaccine that has received most negative blowback was the AstraZeneca vaccine. That's the one that everyone has been cancelling and European countries have got huge stockpiles of it that they haven't been using. Meanwhile, the Pfizer Moderna have been treated as if they are the kind of, you know, Rolls Royce of vaccines. They're yeah. the more expensive yeah. ones. They're the ones that governments have been rushing to spend billions of public money on. And these findings suggest the opposite might be true, that those are in fact riskier and that the AstraZeneca one is, is overall better for you. Again, with all the limitations that I've mentioned in the interpretation of these comparisons, which aren't direct, but yes, that's indeed what the data suggests. That is that, that we maybe uh, dismissed the AstraZeneca vaccine and the other adenovirus vector vaccines on the wrong reasons uh, for very rare uh, but serious side effects in the young population, but, but potentially having much stronger uh, beneficial nonspecific effects. And then in that aspect, it's, it's interesting to note that the adenovirus vector is actually is a live virus, so it does have some resemblances to the live uh, childhood vaccines that I spoke about earlier uh, that can confer this uh, beneficial immune training. This is a question that you don't need to answer, Professor, but have you been vaccinated? <laughs> I, I usually reply that that question, I think, is private and I don't want to inform doormen or uh, even very nice interviewers about that. <laughs> If in a theoretical scenario, if you had uh, children who were in their 20s, um, you would presumably not recommend that they took the Pfizer Moderna? No. Neither, neither of the vaccines. I wouldn't uh, think that was... Uh, of course, that comes from decades of studying nonspecific effects of vaccines and realizing that vaccines, uh, that the protective uh, immunity against the vaccine disease can come at a high price. With the unknowns in relation to the new vaccine types, I would, I would be on the safe side of things and say that uh, as long as your risk of severe COVID is low, uh, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't run the risk of uh, taking a new, and, uh, a new vaccine which hasn't been tested for its overall health effects. And, and regrettably, we still lack that data. We've tried to do the best we can with the very limited data in this study that we have now submitted, but it's not good enough. Uh, I'm, I'm the first to admit or be aware and acknowledge that there are not stronger numbers there, but, but, but that's really the problem we all face that the studies originally weren't designed to address this most pertinent question to everybody who wants to take a vaccine, which is, will I be overall healthier from this vaccine? Final question for you, Professor. Have you been on CNN and BBC and Sky and all of the global mainstream networks talking about the results of your important study? No. <laughs> Interesting. 
Thank you so much, Professor, for sharing your information with us. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much for the invitation. That was Professor Christine Stabel Ben from the University of Southern Denmark sharing the details of her latest study into COVID vaccines. Of course, it's a controversial topic, and she was pretty careful there to emphasize that the samples were smaller than she would like to draw firm statistical conclusions, and that, of course, they were taken at a particular point in the pandemic, and had it been at a different point in the pandemic with more virus about, the differences between the control group and the vaccine group might have been very different, and so on. So she really caveated her research, but she made clear that she thought there was enough there to investigate further. First of all, there seems to be a statistically distinct difference between the adenovirus vaccines and the mRNA vaccines when it comes to all-cause mortality. That clearly needs to be investigated further, as well as what the impact is on potential cardiovascular causes of death. To me, it seemed very significant that all of the controversy around the AstraZeneca vaccine that has dominated for the past year and a half, it was pretty much banned in a number of European countries and around the world, might have been entirely wrong-headed. It might have been that the governments got it the wrong way around and that part of the reason why the UK has experienced better mortality results than continental Europe since the rollout of the vaccine and since the opening up last summer could be explained by the fact that here in the UK most people took AstraZeneca, not Pfizer or Moderna. Very interesting and important and we look forward to more people looking into it. So far, not much sign of that. Thanks for tuning in. This was Unheard.